Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for being here. So my name is Luis. And uh, as, as Dr. Portillo mentioned, I'm an industrial designer with a background in product design. And lately I've been moving forward into interior design. And I say this because above all, I see design from an holistic perspective. And I, either it's in architecture or industrial design, product design or whatever, I see design as a design activity. And that gives the umbrella for my design research or my research, which I label a DC square, understanding as digital design, creativity, and cognition. And from this label, today I'm going to share with you my last study, which was a, my dissertation study. And that study. Oh, yes, absolutely. And that study is the virtual body in immersive virtual reality and its influence on creativity. So we're gonna cover this in this presentation. I wanna share a little bit of how I got here. What, are the, what were the theoretical foundations of this study, the study per se, and a, what we found in this study. So first of all, how did I get here? And I start with this, I believe this, image shows the pivotal moment in which I, I, I found myself like, what's happening with the design process right now? And I define it as paid creativity and paid creativity is we have amazing abilities of represent gorgeous stuff that we design, but when we look to the essence of design, maybe there's not much essence over there. And over years of teaching uh, designers, I see how they began shifting their, their, their tendencies and how they began shifting the tools they used to design and how we as an old school, we learned to design by using sketching, multiple hours of sketching and this all this ambiguous uh, tools or instruments to design. And nowadays students, they move very fast into the digital realm. And, I, and that get me, get me thinking and I was like, how can we affect that? So I began researching a little bit on the design process. I found there are three main, main stages on the design process, the problem definition stage, conceptual ideation stage, and detailed design stage, whatever discipline you are in. And I found that that conceptual design stage, which is this ambiguity of media that we manipulate on traditional media, we needed to be there, we wanted to be there, but new students, they sometimes they don't appreciate the value of that. And that gave point to begin this discussion between that traditional media and digital media. So I began looking on the literature and yes, digital media is much more efficient in terms of efficiency than traditional media because on digital media, if we do a mistake, we don't have to start all over. It will give more photorealistic results. It's more appealing per se to the clients. While a uh, traditional media, it's used to conceptualize ideas. It has ambiguity and, and density. It creates something which literature defines as emergence. And emergence is the ability to see something which is not actually there. And that is what moves creativity a little bit forward. So knowing that students perceive the value of traditional media, but they don't want to use traditional media as much, I began exploring how can we address these needs? And I'm not talking about making them do more traditional media, but how can we begin explore digital media in order for that digital media to compensate or to be able to be used within this, this conceptual ideation stages. So that was the main gap and that was the main concern. And I believe it's critical for students to have deep conceptualization processes through ambiguous uh, tools or through ambiguous media, and above all, develop or th those skills that we as designers need, which are spatial ability skills, which is creativity. So I began looking at it from a different perspective because new digital media has the ability to open new opportunities. And what are those opportunities? And I focused in this study specifically on virtual reality. And why did I focus on virtual reality? Because of this. First of all, there's, there's this concept called embodiment. So embodiment is the way we engage with the world. Embodiment is the way we understand the world. 
So theories, they talk about mind and body, they're different elements. The fact is that in order to generate knowledge, we interact through our physical being and through physicality in order to create that knowledge. And that is done through embodiment. And embodiment refers to the sense of location, the sense of agency, and the sense of, of body ownership. How do I feel in the environment? How do I, I, I am present in that, in that environment in order to have this exchange of knowledge with whatever environment that I, that I have. And within embodiment, I find this concept, which is the sense of embodiment. And the sense of embodiment is how I feel I'm engaged over there. And this may seem pretty obvious because we live in a physical real world in which we are here and the table you're touching and everything you're moving around is there and you're exchanging knowledge with it. Okay, you touch the table and you learn it's hard or soft or whatever. But what happens with the virtual world? And in the virtual world, there is this huge concept which is called presence. And presence is a state of mind. So the hardware will give me the immersion possibilities, but my psychologically, my mind is the one which feel how present I am in that, in that environment, how engaged I am in that environment. So presence has multiple levels. I have spatial presence, social presence, self-presence, etc. We specifically in this study, we pick five of those of those dimensions that have been researched in, in research in presence in VR and that are directly rela related to immersion. With this in hand, we move to the other ingredient of this study, which is cognition. And when we talk about cognitive load theory, cognitive load theory talks about the architecture of the brain which is composed of the long-term memory and the short-term memory or the working memory. The long-term memory is where we achieve knowledge with our, which are those schemas and it's infinite. We can put as many information in there as we want as we're able to attain in our whole lives. While on the other hand, the working memory is limited. We have a, 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 a limited amount of working memory and we cannot surpass that amount. And that is what creates cognitive load. The working memory more specifically is divided in three types of cognitive load, which is intrinsic cognitive load. It means the difficulty of the tasks that we're currently handling. Extraneous cognitive load, which mean external agents that are related to that task and your main cognitive load, which is the learning process that we're developing in that task. Your main is building those schemas that will be later on stored on the long-term memory. So what is the issue? Since working memory is limited, theory tells us or has proven that we can relocate cognitive load between those three elements. So it means that we, if we're able to reduce extraneous cognitive load, we can allocate that either to intrinsic, which is solving the, solving the problem in hand, or to germane cognitive load, which is creating the knowledge that we want to create when we're solving that problem. The other ingredient is creativity. Creativity is basically the ability to produce something new compared to the old. It's very important because we must understand that creativity, creativity is not an, an, a, an inside factor. Actually, it's an outside factor. And why is it an outside factor? Because creativity will not depend on how creative we think we are or how creative we think the outcome we generated is, but how creative is perceived by other individuals. And that is, that is very curious because, well, it's, it's an external factor. And also there are two types of creativity. We have the big C's of creativity, which has this genius type inventions that change the way have, things have been done in the past. And we have the little seeds of creativity, which are actually the ones that on the design process, they move us one step forward. We're looking at one sketch and we see something that we begin to explore and move that process forward. So this study focused on that little seeds of creativity. And the last ingredient was a spatial relations. And excuse me, a spatial ability. And spatial ability, why spatial ability? Because there's multiple studies that have shown the relationship between spatial ability and creativity above many other, many other components. It means that if you are able to increase your spatial ability, you should be able to generate more creative and more novel outcomes. And we specifically focused ourselves in, in spatial visualization because 
there's a continuum on power and difficulty of, of this spatial ability and the, the, the higher level is that of spatial visualization. Because it is being able to manipulate and rotate and, and understand objects in space. That created this conceptual, conceptual framework. So I, have, I will have three conditions or in this study, we had three conditions that will affect presence, cognitive load, ultimately affecting creativity. Understand that creativity as a vital component of the, the design process. So what are going to be these three conditions? And I'm gonna show them in detail in a while. These three conditions are gonna be, a, how do I, this one. These three conditions, they're gonna be a first person condition in which the virtual body is gonna be there physically from a first person point of view. And I will be able to see my body in that virtual reality environment. The second condition is first person, but it's in, it, will, it will be in an offline model. So what is offline and online? The way we see ourselves in, in virtual reality is most commonly done through avatars. And that avatar can be online or offline. So online is when we see the avatar over there and offline is when we don't see anything but we feel we're there. It's similar to what it's called the, the principle of the ghost limb. And it's that principle in which people who lose a limb, they continue to feel that limb, even though that limb is not there. So the same happens in virtual reality. We have online and offline representations. So the first condition was an online representation of the complete body. The second condition is an offline representation of that body in first person point of view. And the third condition was in a third person point of view with online representation, mean, meaning seeing the body over there, but it will be like playing Grand Theft Auto. If any one of you have ever go into video games. And we chose these conditions because those are the most common conditions of the virtual body currently in virtual reality environments. So what was the study? We believe that if we affect these conditions of virtual body, it will affect presence. What we expect that is the more embodied I feel in that environment, the higher the level of presence I will have in that environment and the lower the cognitive load is gonna be because I will be able to feel more natural in there. And this will ultimately affect spatial abilities and creativity. What instruments did we use in this study? We divided this study in a pre and a post uh, test procedure. We used multiple already established and validated instruments. We used a creative personality scale. The creative personality scale is a self-report mechanism in which individuals report how creative they think they are. We used a creative product semantic scale which is to evaluate creativity. And this is very important. It will not evaluate creativity of the individual, but creativity of the design outcome through three parameters, novelty, res uh, resolution, and elaboration and synthesis. We use the mental rotation test, which is a very well established test to measure spatial abilities. We, we generated a presence questionnaire based on the presence questionnaire compendium to be able to assess how present individuals felt in that virtual reality environment. We use the NASA TLX, which is a cognitive load questionnaire. So it's a self-report mechanism to measure cognitive load. And finally, we included psychophysiological devices. More specifically, we included the functional near infrared spectroscopy device, which measures brain activity through oxygenation. So this was the study. Basically, participants were recruited. They were randomly assigned to one of the three conditions. We did a pretest. They were shown the design narrative. We used FNIR to create the baseline. They went into the design task, which I will be covering in a, in a while. And then they, they did a post-test. And after that, all that, whatever they designed, that was evaluated by external judges. And this, the reason of this is, remember when I talked that creativity is not, it's not internal, creativity is external. Is how those gatekeepers feel the outcome is creative or not. So that was the reason of evaluating this by external peers. This was the study set up. So we, we created in our lab, we work with three computers, basically one with VR, one with the BioPack bio equipment, which is the FNIR device, and the other just for Google Forms. 
And we design an intervention. We carefully designed an intervention. So how, what we did here, first, we based ourselves in, a, in nine square grid problems, which are commonly used in architecture and design in order to begin developing ideas. We also uh, based ourselves on the theory of dominant, subdominant, and subordinate structures from, from Costello in order to, to arrange whatever they were arranging. And we wanted to give this specific problem a logical approach. It, we wanted for it to be a logical problem solving approach. Because remember, we're not looking at those big seas of creativity, we were looking at those little seas of creativity. So how does, does this looks more in, in, in shape? We created this virtual environment and we, we imagine ourselves in Mars. So we wanted to create a virtual environment which was completely out of this world, literally. So we placed these individuals in Mars and we created these modules, these cubes that they needed to arrange and they needed to, to manipulate, move, arrange and get into that space. This was intentionally designed because those are scaffolded activities. And scaffolded activities are activities that have one specific purpose. And in this case, what, was, what is the purpose? Spatial ability. We want to increase spatial ability. We want to see if we were able to increase spatial ability. So we developed these modules. There were like, if I'm not mistaken, there were like 12 modules over there in the dominant, subdominant, and subordinate characteristics of them that individuals through what you see here on this menu over here, that one, they needed to select content and they needed to select materials as well. And we give a couple of restraints in order for it to keep it a logical problem solving uh, activity. Also, it's very important when we're measuring cognitive load, the problem in task or the task in hand, excuse me, has to be difficult enough in order to be able to cope that working memory and to see what's happening with, uh, with the extraneous and uh, germane cognitive load. So if we give participants a super simple task, we will not be able to see variations in cognitive load, basically. So this is the first condition. So here I have an online uh, representation of my body. So here you can see participants. If the participant looked down, he was able to see his feet. That is the, me the, the, the menu. So the, over there, he will be selecting uh, materials and content of that cubes. And he was able to manipulate these cubes exactly as if he were in, in, in a real environment. And it was uh, constrained by, by the law of physics. So we apply gravity and we apply law of physics in order for them to be able to, 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 to manipulate this, these cubes. The task, the main task was to select content, we, we told them these were containers and they are required to generate some sort of sculpture-like composition within the space station environment. That was the first condition. This is the second condition. So this is the offline representation of the body you see over there. The only thing I see are my hands. I don't see anybody. I don't see arms, legs, torso, nor anything. I just have the hands. So this is the offline representation. Once again, in a first person perspective, in a first person point of view. And finally, we have the uh, third person online virtual body. This was very interesting to develop because normally this is not done in virtual reality. And we did it in virtual reality. This is normally done through looking through a window in, in the screen, a monitor, which is the way we play Grand Theft run tap out. So we developed this in which participants, once again, they were able to see, and it was very funny because if I wave my hands or if I move my body, the body will react. So it will immediately create that connection that I am that individual. You can see over there, like I was dancing and, and, and the, the, the avatar was dancing with him. So we did the data collection process. We used that near device, near works with a light. So basically it goes on your front head, on your scalp, and it emits light and the light gets refracted, but it's able to go through the scalp into the brain and comes out. And by measuring the changes in light, it generates a light graphs, which we later convert into 
oxygrats, which relate to oxygen levels in the brain. I'm gonna show that in a while. This was more or less the process. We placed the, 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 the headset on top of the individuals and individuals participated. This is the, the, the data from the peer. So it generates a huge amount of data. This is a light graph in which we created markers and we began filtering and cleaning that light graph because we need to, first we need to remove artifacts. Artifacts are movements that don't constitute uh, changes in, in, in oxygenation. And we have to apply a couple of filters in order to make this data clean for, for analysis. Once we have the data clean, this is an oxygraph. So now you can see the, the, the blue lines and the red lines. And what those are telling me is the red lines are oxygenation levels and the blue lines are deoxygenation levels. So it's telling me that uh, that blood is already deoxygenated. And what we want to look when we're looking at cognitive load, we want to look at the red ones, which are oxygenation levels. And with that, we begin to create bar graphs and brain topographies to understand what's happening inside the head. So what did we find? We have 72 participants in total. These are a couple of videos of participants engaging. That is the lab in, we, in which we work. And one of the limitations of this study, and you will see that at the end, is because of the, of the characteristics of the lab, even though we have a, had a virtual headset in which participants could be walking around the physical environment, we didn't have the physical space to do that. So participants, they move by teleporting themselves to one place to another. And we thought this could have impacted not being able to develop as much spatial abilities, but well, we'll see when we go into findings. So this, our, this was our sample size. It was a convenient sample size. So it was basically gathered in a Southwestern university here in, in the United States. Most of the sample was female. And we, had, we did not did any exploration between gender differences, even, there, even though there's a lot of literature that says that development, for example, of spatial skills in gender is different between female and male. So that could be a, a further exploration process. And most of the sample were junior and senior students. So we knew that they were already familiarized with the design process and uh, followed by graduate students. The, the time, the average time that participants spent on this environment was around 21 minutes or 20.67 minutes. And it was very, this is very important because this will relate to our concept, which is called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to adapt in even very low uh, time conditions, in very fast conditions. So the first thing we did is, okay, we have that creative personality scale before the intervention. We measure if there were differences between the three conditions, because if there were differences, it would have been complicated. There were no difference between them. It meaning that all individuals which participated in all of three conditions, they felt they were pretty much the same level of, of, of creativity. And then we began looking variable through variable. So first let's take a look at what happens with the virtual body in terms of presence. From the, from the questionnaire compendium, we manipulated four specific variables or four specific dimensions, which was presence, appearance, interaction, and embodiment. And we also asked one general question, how physical you thought you were in that environment. And, that, and those participants was rated in a one to 99 scale. So on the first things, we found that condition three had significant, statistically significant differences lower than condition one and condition two. What is that telling me? That the virtual body in the third point perspective makes me feel less present in that environment than the other two conditions. And this was pretty much what we expected. It was kind of obvious. And also in the self-perceived, they felt that they were less present over there. Looking more in detail, the main feature was appearance. Appearance was the one in the pairwise comparison that generated that difference. So they felt they were present. They felt the interaction was accordingly. They felt they had the body over there, but the appearance is what makes it look weird, okay? 
this does not mean that the third person virtual body is, not, is a no-no to use in virtual reality. What it means is that we have to be very careful in what we use it because the third person point of view is very good for displacement actions, for big movements. It was easier for them to move from point A to point B using the third perspective, okay? But it was harder for them to manipulate stuff using that third point perspective. We looked at the second at the second variable, and on the second variable, we found that condition three increased the cognitive load on the NASA TLX. When we looked at task difficulty, we did not find any differences. So it meaning it means that all three conditions were equally difficult for them to tackle, and that is good. And uh, we, we also combined the NASA TLX plus the task difficulty, and once again, condition three was much more demanding. But in this case, was not was much more demanding, not that the not in comparison to the other two conditions, but only with condition two. So condition two is the one that I have the offline environment. Okay, so that the offline avatar. So that begins to tell me that cognitive load in an offline representation of a virtual body is much more lower than having to have an avatar. So that avatar is becoming extraneous cognitive load. It means that it's adding more information to the other that it's increasing my, my cognitive load. These are the bar graphs that we developed and these are the means of the three conditions. So you can see condition three here, condition two, which is the lowest and condition one. So at this moment, one may think, okay, so if this is the lowest, we should have the more creative outcomes from here because allegedly, if I have lesser cognitive load, I will be able to focus on the intrinsic cognitive load, which is the, the task in hand, which is arranging the cubes and manipulating those cubes. So let's take a look. In, in time, we also wanted to see what happened in time. And this functional near infrared spectroscopy, this opens a completely new window because self-report questionnaires will only answer to the end of the task. But with a year, we can see the development along the process. And we found, for example, that condition one increased all the time, the cognitive load through time. Condition three, also 83%. This was more demanding than this one. And condition two decreased the cognitive load. It meant that when individuals went into solving the task, at the beginning, maybe it was difficult for them. But in those 20 minutes, it, be it began getting easier and easier for them as they, as they move, move away. And we developed brain topographies to see if there were differences between left and right brain. We didn't find like significant differences on those. So what happens with this and spatial ability? All of them. And this is this for me, it's a really important finding because all of them increased spatial abilities. All of them. And we run a ANOVA with them, a, a repeated measures ANOVA. And afterward, we run pairwise comparison. But regardless, we found differences between that condition two was the one that increased the most spatial abilities, but all of them increased spatial abilities in participants. And I believe this is a really important finding because it's telling us that using virtual reality with scaffolded activities in very short amounts of time can help increase spatial abilities in our students. Now let's take a look what happened with creativity. So remember I told you, one may think that condition two should have been the most creative. Actually, condition one was the most creative of them all. Yes, it generated more cognitive load, but was the most creative of them all. And when we look at theories of creativity, it makes sense when we talk about something Csikszentmihalyi Mihaly talks about, which is called the flow. And the flow in creativity is that engagement that we have when we are performing a creative activity. And actually, even though condition one, which presence showed us has the, had the higher level of presence, it also generated more cognitive load, but individuals felt they were more engaged in the activity. Okay, so uh, it increased creativity in comparison with condition three. And actually it was very interesting because the, the one which we expected, which was condition two, had the lowest levels of creativity. So 
individuals maybe went in there, began manipulating, they didn't have the body, they didn't engage enough, and they finished sending the task and they did not connect it with that flow I previously mentioned in that specific activity. And dividing, looking at, at the three aspects I told you that the creative products, uh, personal, creative product semantic scale had three specific dimensions. The one that generated, generated those differences was elaboration and, and synthesis. And this is what I was telling you that condition two in novelty was the less novel of them all. Okay, also it is very important to note that this was done by external reviewers. So we selected specific peers that had similar characteristics with generated a baseline. They evaluated everything differently and they coded and then we measure reliability and then, then recode it based, based on, that, on, that, on that measurement of, of reliability. These are just examples of the outcomes that they have. So in this, I believe one, three, and five, which is this one, these are condition, condition one, which was the most creative of them all. This is condition three, and a condition, this is condition two. Now we wanted to see if there's a relationship between presence and spatial ability and presence and creativity. So we run a couple of multiple regression models in which the first model that we run, 8% of the variance of, of uh, spatial ability was accounted by presence. It means that there is significant relationship between presence and spatial ability. The more present I feel in that, it's, in that space, the more I'm able to develop my spatial abilities. And we run a second model. In this model, what we did is we take out uh, residuals. We did not eliminate outliers whatsoever. We just took residuals away and we were able to increase 20% of, of, the, of the variance of spatial abilities accounted for by presence. And between presence and creativity, we did not find any relation whatsoever. So being more present in that space will not make you more creative or, or will not yield more creative outcomes. And finally, we try to analyze cognitive load with spatial ability and creativity, and we were not able to find any relationships between cognitive load and spatial abilities and cognitive load and creativity. It was very funny because we did this, like trying to have different approaches and we measured, okay, this is how creative they feel they are. So that's that creative personality scale. And this is how creative my outcome was. And we wanted to see if there was a relationship. I feel I'm very creative. Let's see if what I developed was considered very creative. And there was no relationship whatsoever. So basically all environments affect presence. We have to be very careful to discern if we want thin operations or, or action movements between the virtual body that we, that we will select. Uh, cognitive load is definitely affected by virtual body. Scaffolded activities did improve spatial abilities and all these environments create a, they yield that ambiguity and density that can be used in order to, to, to create, the, to influence the design process. From a theoretical standpoint, we try to merge multiple theories. So we try to merge cognitive theories, cognitive psychology, design theories, and, and computational sciences. From a methodolog methodological standpoint, we added new tools to try to, to address design research from a different perspective. And from a practical point, standpoint, I believe this study, or we believe this study can help develop future interactions in VR, depending on what are those specific needs that you, that you require in terms of the virtual body. Limitations, I told you, uh, first we had a, limit of, a limited physical space. We have to acknowledge that using a mirror and the VR head mounted display, since they're both located on the, on the forehead, it's, it's troublesome. We have to be very careful and that took, takes a lot of time. And, and, and we have to acknowledge that movement can be generated between them that can somehow uh, open a possibility to affect the, the outcome. And uh, well, we use a convenient sample which was basically one university in the United States. What are the future directions of this? More than applying the methodology, 
I see this study because what is, what's my vision? My vision is, and I'm gonna do the close up with what I talked at the beginning. We need to find new tools for conceptual ideation stages or practices in the design process that are more keen to design students and they have those attributes that we value from sketching and modeling and stuff. And I believe that we as educators, design educators, we should not be trying to make design students learn the way we learn design, but we should be adapting our schemas to the way they learn the world. And that is this digital technologies. And this study, if I look at future study, I, will have, I would like to have future studies with sketching done in virtual reality, which actually is a fact right now, in which you can generate idea, not manipulate cubes like I give them, but even make it more ambiguous for them to be able to sketch in, in digital environments. And this could be pretty much combined with protocol analysis. Protocol analysis is very well used on design research, design process research to understand the moves and the process that the designers have on their design process. And further and foremost, this can be replicated with any type of technology. Like I, we did this with virtual reality, but this can be replicated, for example, with augmented reality to see how that could affect those creative processes on the design. That was it. Thank you very much. And I'm open for questions.